You didn't come to be better than everybody. And the social media just is pounding on people. Here's the glamorous dress I bought. Here's the person celebrity that I hung out with. The cascading degree to which this is going on is just horrible. And yet people are feeling a sincere sense of anxiety and depression. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and I'm blessed to be here with you. And today we are surely blessed. I'd like to thank Father Spitzer so much for taking the time out of his life and his schedule and all the truly glorious works that he's doing to be here with us in Mamas in Spirit. So thank you, Father Spitzer. Oh, it's great to be with you, Lindy. Thank you for the opportunity. And I don't know how often you get to be with all of these women. (laughs) (laughs) Well, probably not as often as other audiences, but I think it's wonderful. Me too. (laughs) So thank you. And will you please do the honor of opening us in prayer? Absolutely. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the blessing of this good ministry and Lindy's presence with us and all that she tries to do. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us this day to inspire us, to guide us, and protect us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We also ask you, Lord, to bless those in our audience to inspire them and guide them as well through that same Spirit. We ask all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, and St. Therese of Lisieux, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Spitzer. And I feel deeply moved because I have recently completed your book, Finding True Happiness, Satisfying Our Restless Hearts. And it spoke so deeply to my soul, really. And I found it to be a very healing work and clarifying work. And so I want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you made it through it and was certainly an attempt to be both uh, healing and clarifying. So thank you. Yes, and for those of you who don't know, Father Spitzer is the president of the Magis Center and the Spitzer Center, and I'd love for you to share more about that later and also how listeners can get more connected with all of the different works that you're doing and the breadth of all of the works that you're doing. Uh, No problem there. (laughs) Okay, great. So, Father Spitzer, in reading your book, you talk about four levels of happiness. And as a mom and as a woman, and also spending most of my days really in the ordinary life of things, I see people really struggling and witness deep struggles as people search for meaning and happiness in things that are not eternal and ultimately won't bring them happiness. So could you give us a brief overview of the four levels levels of happiness? Mm -hmm. Yes. As you kind of move up the levels, you'll see that the kind of happiness gets more pervasive, enduring, and deep. So it actually gets to the point where you have a form of happiness that is doing so much good beyond yourself, and it lasts not only for time in this world, but unto eternity. And the quality is so deep in terms of its spiritual and intellectual and creative intentionality that it really makes our life worth living. And Aristotle, a long time ago, pointed out that happiness was the one thing you could choose for itself. Everything else was chosen for the sake of happiness. And so just imagine that everything else is chosen. The spouse you want, the friends you make, the job you pursue, the interests you pursue, the organizations you join, every judgment you make about yourself, every judgment you make about others, all depends on one little word, happiness. And so Aristotle thought it was the most important word that anybody could define. And that's why he devoted the entire Nicomachean ethics to the definition of happiness. So with that in mind, we've got four basic choices and they correspond to four sets of fundamental desires within us. But level one happiness is the most superficial. It's the least pervasive, enduring, and deep. Yet at the same time, it's very intense, it's immediately gratifying, and it's surface apparent. So you don't have to study or do anything to get it. You can eat a bowl of linguine, for example, and you can have a 
lot of level one happiness. You can have a nice glass of wine and get level one happiness. But is it going to be pervasive? No. Is it going to do some good beyond myself for anybody? Not really. Number two, level two, is what's called ego comparative happiness. Now, ego comparative happiness is what 71% of our culture is into. That's their dominant view of happiness. The desire to be successful, the desire to be recognized, the desire to be better than others. So it's ego, so it's always pointing to the self. Comparative, it's going to involve a comparison. So it's the kind of happiness that we see, for example, when people are asking questions like, who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's got more power, who's got less power, who's got more popularity, less popularity. Who's smarter? Who's less smart? Who's better looking? Who's less better looking? Who's more athletic? Who's less athletic? So we see that people start getting obsessed and especially on being recognized for status and popularity, etc. And power's a big deal. Winning's a big deal. So it's ego comparative happiness and it really is where our culture has set its focus on for success. So when people say, did I have a successful life? They can go, yeah, I was better than 80% of the people at the following five things. And I was smarter than 70% of the people at these three things. And I had more money than Joe and Harry. And by the way, I had a lot more power and status than Amy and Lucy and whoever. So the point is, all you do at the end of your life, you got nothing except I was better, I did more, I achieved more, I had more money, and it stops right there. It's more pervasive, enduring, and deep than living for a bowl of linguine, but not that much more. I mean, all you can say at the end of your life was I was better than everybody. And it gives you a lot of ego satisfaction and a lot of recognition while you're alive, and that can obviously be satisfying to the ego. But were you truly contributive to anybody beyond yourself? Probably not a lot. And were you faith-based? Did you really look for your most pervasive, enduring, and deep dignity and destiny of life to be with God and to live eternally and to live for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home through God? Did you do anything like that? No. No, because level two doesn't do anything like that. Level three happiness is contributive happiness. So now the focus is no longer on the self, but the focus is on the person away from the self. The focus now is on trying to make an optimal positive difference to my family and to my friends, to my community, to the institutions for which I work and with which I work, to make an optimal positive difference to the kingdom of God. God and to my church, and if I'm so lucky, to the society and to the culture. So I'm looking to make the most of my life. I want to make the optimal positive difference to as many people in as many contexts as I can beyond myself so that when I leave this world, I get this sense that my life made a difference. Nobody wants to get to 80 years old and go, hmm, now what was the difference between the value of my life and that of a rock? Because even if you're better than everybody at everything and you did nothing for anyone so that the rock did as much for humanity as you did, then at the end of the day, you're in incipient despair. I mean, nobody can stand to think that their life made no difference to the world. And the moment the shocking realization happens that you didn't, And you look back and you say, I was better than everybody at everything. It won't make a darn bit of difference. And so, of course, then you're really at a juncture where you see that you lived beneath yourself and you didn't even live for your eternal destiny. The fourth level, as you can imagine, is transcendent happiness or what I call faith-based happiness. And that's where I know that I was not meant for this world alone. I wasn't even meant to make a contribution to this world alone, but I was meant for the next life. I was meant for eternity, and I was meant not for 
partial truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, but for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home through God, who is perfect truth itself, perfect love itself, perfect goodness itself, perfect beauty itself, and perfect being itself. And so I'm essentially recognizing that I am so much more than a this worldly person. And not only that, but I have more to contribute than just making the world a better place for my having lived. I could actually make the kingdom of God better off for my having lived. I could try and bring as many people into the kingdom through my efforts as I can to cooperate with the mission of Jesus Christ that I can. I could try to not only make a difference to those people, I could actually make a difference to the church. I could make a difference to the culture and try and instill more transcendent value in the culture so that the culture will lead people to God. Etc. So I could do all these things which have an eternal significance, a significance in perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, a significance grounded in my relationship with the Lord who not only loves me, but created me and for whom I am destined to be with if I follow his path into the kingdom of heaven. And that makes all the difference. And that's why St. Augustine said at the beginning of the confessions, it's an autobiography about all the false meanings, false views of happiness that he went through in his lifetime. But at the very beginning, he gives us the whole key to interpreting the text. He's talking to God here. For thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. And I'd love for us to talk a little bit to speak directly to the Mamas in Spirit audience about Mm -hmm. some of the ways that I see that manifesting in the world around me and as a woman and as a mom and very specifically. In level one, I thought it was wonderful that you used this time. I'd never heard you use the example of wine. Women love to talk about wine and chocolate. (laughs) I would talk about ice cream, (laughs) but wine and chocolate. Level two, very much material goods, purses, clothes, cars, and then also our physical appearance. And I would say that people would even deny level one for egocentric reasons of level two of being thinner Mm -hmm. and other things of the sort. And then in regards to level three, I see women striving to do good works and feel good about it and Mm -hmm. feel like they're contributing something. Mm -hmm. But the piece that's very much missing is when you talk about our hearts are restless Mm -hmm. until they rest in you. Mm -hmm. And that there's always this pervasive long that will never go away and never goes away until we actually rest in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I love how you also talked in your book about how we have to remain in level four happiness. Not only do we have to get there, Mm -hmm. but then we have to make choices every day, little yeses, to be able to remain and to be able to stay there in level four. Mm -hmm. We're so human. We can fall away. And then also we're tempted. We're tempted still by the level twos or the level threes, even the level ones. Mm -hmm. And so every day of our lives, we have to remain in the Lord. Mm -hmm. So first, Father Spitzer, what about for the people that are out there that are really caught up, especially in the level two? Mm -hmm. How can they learn and shift their thinking, have a significant paradigm change per se within the context of their own lives? Mm to understand this and then make movement in the direction towards the transcendent, towards God. That's really good. Maybe before I answer that question, the brief answer to that is goal setting. And I'll talk about goal setting in just a moment. But for the time being, just important to remember, level one is not completely bad. You can still enjoy a great glass of wine and chocolate. You just don't want to live for wine and chocolate. You don't want to make it dominant. The same thing with level two. It's not completely bad because after all, we do have to have a sense of self-respect and self-esteem and a sense of success and self-mastery. And that comes really with level two and that's good, but we don't want to live for status, popularity, respect, and for winning power, etc. So the same with level three. Of course, we want level three. We want to make an optimal positive difference with our lives. But by itself, it's just not going to be enough. And there was a great 
poll that was done by the American Psychiatric Association 2004 by Kanita Dervik and 11 other psychiatrists, and they compared religiously affiliated with non-religiously affiliated people. And non-religiously affiliated people had significantly higher rates. So these are people not affiliated with any religion or God, and they had significantly higher rates of depression and impulsivity, aggressivity, substance abuse, familial tensions, and suicides. So Level three is not going to be enough. At the end of the day, we need level four, for God has made us for himself. And our hearts are going to be restless until we rest in him. He's made us for eternal destiny. We'll never be satisfied with this world alone. And he's made us for perfect truth, love, goodness, and beauty, and being destiny. And that's what will satisfy us. And all that being said, so there is some good to level one, two, and three. But if you live for it, it's all over because level four needs to be pervading it all. Yes, thank you. And that part about it not being all bad is so helpful. And I think it's very helpful to Christians and Catholic Christians and all people because we do need a healthy sense of ego and of self. So it's not a complete rejection of self Mm -hmm. because we are loved and created by an all loving and eternal God. And I think women can have really, really low sense of self-esteem and there can be confusion about that healthy sense of esteem that is always used for the glory of God. That's right. And we absolutely want healthy self-esteem. We don't have to have that of Joan of Arc, but we can certainly have a very healthy sense of self-esteem, which is very humble. If you have Joan of Arc, that's great. But if you have a humble sense of yourself as efficacious, a humble sense of yourself as somebody who can really make a difference through your works and actions, then you really are going to be much better off for level three and level four, to be honest with you. So it kind of sometimes grace really does build on nature. But back to the answer, how do we move from becoming a level one dominant. And what I mean by dominant is I live for wine, chocolate, cars, and linguine. How do I move from a level two dominant? I live for people's adulation and my sense of success by accumulating successes. And I live for popularity and recognition of my athletic prowess, intellectual prowess, or whatever it may be. So how do I get out of it? And goal setting is the answer. If you don't have goals, then you can do anything you want because all roads will lead you to the goalless conclusion. But if you do have goals, then you're going to have to make some decisions and some commitments And you're going to have to foreclose some roads because some of them aren't going to get you there. First of all, I do think we need to make some level three goals. That's going to help us to get out of level one and level two dominant, right? And remember, 71% of our culture is level two dominant. So that being the case, we got to be absolutely assiduous about making these level three goals. So take out a little chart. Take out a little notebook or a piece of paper and just put down these questions. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my family? Leave some space. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my friends? How can I make an optimal positive difference to the institutions or the associations with which I'm affiliated? How can I make an optimal positive difference to my community? Maybe we join a school board or the junior league or whatever it is. How can I make an optimal positive difference to my church? This is really important. How can I do for them? How can I make an optimal positive difference to the kingdom of God? So I might have a friend who is searching. I can see. And all I need to do is lead them to the Maja Center website or something to get some evidence for God or to give them a free copy of Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life or whatever it may be. So the key thing there is, how can I lead them to God if I'm so lucky? And I may not be. How could I even make an optimal positive difference to the culture and the society? So these are the questions to put on your sheet. And then leave space to answer all those questions to the extent you can right now. But leave plenty of space. Maybe put one question for every every half page. So get a little notebook and just keep adding to it. You're just not going to think of everything in a single try. It's going to take you a year to even begin to get a good sense of what your level three goals ought to be. And right when you finish that, put at the end of those sheets, for this I came. So you're coming for these things, the optimal positive difference to family, to friends, to church, to kingdom of God, to culture, to institutions, to associations and things, a community where you can really make an optimal positive difference. 
You didn't come to be better than everybody. And the social media just is pounding on people to do the opposite. Here's the fancy party I went to. Here's the glamorous dress I bought. Here's the person, celebrity that I hung out with. I mean, it's just level two to the point of being sickening. And yet the cascading degree to which this is going on is just horrible And yet people are feeling a sincere sense of anxiety and depression. Like just in the last 15 years, depression has gone up by 15% among young people, the ones most involved in social media. And suicides have gone up by 31% among young people just in 15 years. 31% depression and suicides in 15 years, over 2% a year. It's terrible, but I think social media has exacerbated level two into monstrous proportions. And so it's really essential to put at the end, for this I came. I didn't come to be better than anybody else. I came to use my gifts. So God gave me some gifts of speaking and intelligence. That's great. I should recognize them. To do what? Not to be better than people, but to use those gifts as best I can to make an optimal positive difference to family, friends, church, community, etc. That's why I have those gifts. For this I came. God gave you all of this sensitivity to this ministry in media, which is great. It's a fine gift. To do what? To make an optimal positive difference to family, to friends, to community, to church, to kingdom, etc. So as long as we keep putting that little thing on, we don't have to say, gee, I don't have any talents, esteem, or anything. We don't have to play almost the humble game, if I can put it that way. We can say, honestly, we've got some gifts. We don't have other gifts. I certainly was never given the athletic gift or the good looks gift, but I certainly got other gifts, which for me, I can use to make an optimal positive difference. So that's the first thing. Let's set out our level three goals and let's figure out which ones we're going to work on at any given point in time. So let's just say we take some sets of goals that we've set for ourselves of ways we want to do things, and we just decide we're going to put in a certain amount of time on this one, this one, this one, this one, and then take one from each of the categories, maybe a little bit from each of the categories, and then just say, these are my goals. I'm going to do five minutes of this or 10 minutes of that, or I'm going to volunteer once a week for this, or I'm going to go to church, da-da-da-da. So you can get that down pretty easily. So you brought up time there at the end and using our time. And then you also brought up social media. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we should be mindful to fast or at least partially fast from some of the things that we're aware that are really bringing us away from God? For those of you who don't know, Father Spitzer is a Jesuit priest. And so obviously you practice Ignatian spirituality or an Mm -hmm. absolute expert in it more than me. Not me. I I, I maybe uh, know a lot of about it, but I wish I could practice it as well as I knew it. But anyway. Well, oh. in the practice of it, I think of that attentiveness to what is pulling me towards God and what's pulling me away from God, what's giving me a sense of consolation and closeness and intimacy and a deeper sense of belonging home and love with the Lord mm-hmm. versus the things that cause me angst and loneliness and despair. And women struggle with this and people struggle with this all the time in a very real way in everyday life. For example, with social media. It can be addictive. People could just even unconsciously go and tap on the little emblem without thinking about it on their phone and head back into the app for more despair, for more things that are going to communicate to them, really that they are of less value or they're going to internalize it that way. So in using our time and our time being precious, should we pull back and should we fast from some things in order to put our time into the things that will help us to make an optimal positive difference and also start shifting our interior lives more towards God? Mm -hmm. Well, that's perfect. I mean, I'm glad you said that because making the level three and level four goals is not enough. You do have to cut back 
on the social media. You know, people go, you mean I have to give up social media? No, not right away you don't. What you'll notice is if you just start cutting back and replacing. See, that's the thing. You need both. You need to consciously cut back on level one and level two stuff. Social media is level two off the wall. Level one, maybe cut back a little bit on the getting all these possessions, purses, or the wine. You can still enjoy wine. You can still enjoy a purse. But the thing is, you just got to cut back on some of that stuff, especially the amount of psychic energy and time that you're giving over to it. And if you cut back on that, you just can't stop and do nothing. You have to replace it with, okay, I'm going to give some time to my husband or my children, or I'll give some extra time to this friend that right now is in need, or I'm going to give some extra time to this church ministry that I might be good at. So you're cultivating the level three goals. So you just say, when I cut back on the social media or when I cut back on devoting huge amounts of time and psychic energy to shopping or decorating or whatever is occupying my level one instincts, you replace it with level three and level four. It's really hard at first because you have to disengage one set of habits and engage another set of habits. So cutting back on television, basically it can be so hard. I've heard people just tell me, I had to give it up cold turkey. I just couldn't turn on the darn thing because the minute I turned it on, I got addicted. And so the main thing is, you know yourself, can you just cut back and then replace with those level three and level four goals? If you can, then cutting back is the way to do it. And then you're going to see as you kind of start getting more and more hooked on level three and level four, you're going to see, oh, I really like this. And I like this more than I like watching the detective program or going on the social media and tapping on the app. I like it more. And so then maybe you want to go cold turkey ultimately and just say, I'd just rather give my time instead of just watching Ogs of Time and this or that or doing this and that. I'd just rather do some more prayer or something like that. And I remember in my own life, the things I did go cold turkey on, I just got hooked on prayer and I like prayer more and more. So I just thought, well, I'll do more prayer and I'll read more edifying books. Or now I have them read to me by a computer or something. I'll do something like that rather than spending time the level one and two. I think a lot of people think, well, gosh, the guy never goes on vacation. Well, it's not that I'm tired or anything. I like working. I like my ministry and I love people. So I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. So I like working a lot. For me, it's a level three, level four commitment that used to be filled with other things, but isn't filled with those things anymore. It's filled with new things. And I love that example and that example of not having that inclination to go do the dream things of our culture, like take a trip because you've created, praise God Mm -hmm. and due to God, this deeply meaningful life. And essentially kind of what you're pointing to is almost like a behavioral therapy for the Lord (laughs) for the most important of reasons is that when we change our behaviors and Mm -hmm. we consciously choose to spend our time doing things that bring a deep sense of meaning, Mm -hmm. purpose, connectedness, belonging, Mm -hmm. that's a life well lived and a joyful life, a happy life. Yeah. And actually, sometimes you can get tired. Like writing can be an exhausting enterprise, actually more than speaking or going on a show because you're just constantly focused. So you might want to get into something that's not writing that might be good. Like sometimes just saying a little rosary where you're just connecting with the Lord. But when you get started on prayer, that can be very exhausting too. So you kind of start slowly And then you build up so that you connect real fast with the Blessed Virgin Mary or with the Lord. And so then when you do, you can replace more. So you actually get hooked on these things. And remember, level one and level two, you don't need any work to get hooked on them. You can get instantly hooked. And for that reason, we call them addictive. So you could actually get hooked on shopping. You can get hooked on television watching. Like that, you can get hooked. You don't have to be an alcoholic and so forth. And, of course, you can get hooked on social media, and there are so many other things. But if it's level one and level two, it's almost by definition addictive and almost instantly gratifying and very, very persuasive to pull you into it. Whereas level three and level four, you actually have to learn 
that this is good and it's a much greater sense of happiness. But once you kind of let go and you start, for example, doing contributive things, so you get a ministry going and you like doing it and you're serving people, then you see, I really like living for this. I just don't want to live for shopping anymore or I don't want to live for bonbons and leave it to beaver reruns anymore. I don't want to live for having the best fashions anymore. I could care less because you become detached. So the more you get hooked on level three and level four, and level four is your prayer life. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the more you get hooked on those things, you have to have the goals to get there. Mm -hmm. And it's going to require some work to get there. And so it's going to commitments and concertedness, but you're going to get there. And when you do get more and more hooked on it, you'll see this is as enjoyable as turning on that favorite television program. It really is. Like, prayer is just as enjoyable. I remember (laughs) when I started coming to these insights, hey, prayer is just as enjoyable as this other thing, which I consider to be recreational. Prayer is kind of recreational. Ministry is kind of recreational. Actually, people say, well, Spencer, you're sick. But uh, (laughs) but I'm, I'm really not sick. I'm really well, (laughs) you know, in that regard. And it is amazing. But give yourself time. You're not going to get hooked on level three and level four overnight. And you're going to have to make goals and you're going to have to make commitments. But start your level three goals and then you got to do your level four goals. And once you got those things going, then you've got a good recipe for getting healthier and healthier. Yes. And I feel like that shift, I love how you says it takes a commitment. I feel like it also takes courage. As someone who lives in kind of a common community in our American culture, Mm -hmm. it's really making a choice to live against the grain and to be different. And that takes courage. Yeah. Well, I've just bought a new briefcase. But I actually once had somebody come and they go, oh, Father Spencer, your briefcase is just beat up. It's terrible. Do you realize the image you're creating? I said, very much so. <laughs> you know? And it's okay. Priest has beat up briefcase. So what does this mean in the whole order of salvation? It means maybe he takes his vow of poverty seriously. Now, like I just said, I violated that already because I went out and bought a new one the other day. But nevertheless, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that at some point, you have to be able to be countercultural. And that's the courage you're talking about, Lindy. You have to be able to say, I really don't care. And you're going to have a lot of level one and level two friends. I'm just going to tell you right now. They're going to be the pressurizer. And the poor young people who have to deal with social media and the social pressure created on that medium is really going to make it hard. But I'm just saying right now, if you want to be the happiest you can be, live for the highest dignity you can live for, live for the most pervasive, enduring, and deep goals that you can get. And if you want eternal life and you want to be embedded in a relationship with the Lord that is really quite satisfying unto perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, then stick with it, make the sacrifice, and the first thing after you make your goals is you got to decide, I'm going to be countercultural. I'm not going to let these people get me. And my byline on social media is going to be, so what? So what does this have to do with the whole order of salvation? So what does this have to do with optimal meaning and purpose in life? You met a celebrity? So what? It doesn't have anything to do with the whole order of self. It doesn't have anything to do with ultimate meaning, purpose in life. So you had uh, dinner at Michelle's. I, I don't know, whatever. So what does this have? Nothing. And we just got to keep asking this question, first of ourselves. And then we have to be able to say when people start putting the pressure on us, they're going to try and drag you right back down mm-hmm. to level one and level two. Believe me. They're going to try and drag you down. And not consciously. They just want you to be like them. They're going to feel weird when you seem to be not like them as much anymore. So they're going to try and pull you back. They're not doing it out of malice at all. They just want you to be in the same state that they were before. Sure. But if you maintain what you do, 
you're going to influence them. What you're going to do is pull them forward instead of letting them pull you backwards. And you just have to say, I'm doing this not just for myself, not just to maintain my own sense of meaning and purpose and get to my goals. I'm doing this for them. Now, you don't have to be sarcastic and just say what I said. So what? (laughs) Right? But you can say, I got to be honest with you. Celebrities and Michelle's doesn't do it for me. It used to, but I'm kind of into these other things right now. But I I still want to be your friend, and I still uh, love being around you. But don't pressure me into this because, to be honest with you, it doesn't mean as much to me as it used to. And you don't have to say I've grown beyond it because then they might think you're belittling them. Just say instead, well, I just don't find it as satisfying as I used to find it. And now I find other things a little bit more satisfying. And if they say like what, then it's your time to evangelize. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got them now on the hook. You can invite. Yeah, exactly. Just like God's invitation. Uh One of the things that's really helpful for me in daily life is to think about our pilgrimage. And I have a strong sense, even when I feel tempted by something of this path will lead towards emptiness and this path will lead towards intimacy with God and ultimate fulfillment. It's all to me seemingly at the end of the day, even though it can be confusing sometimes, it's either an affirmation of God or a negation of God. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I'm either going to find a sense of belonging or not. So even though this group of women may seem enticing or this material item may seem enticing or whatever it may be, Ultimately, I have this deep sense that that is a path towards really level one or level two or just loneliness, really, that I'm not Mm going to find what I'm hoping for or looking for. Yeah, that's exactly right. And St. Ignatius really talks about that and kind of his first rule for the discernment of spirits. He says, there are a lot of objects in this world that are immediately satisfying. And because of that, the devil can rush in and intensify that, right? Just go right to your imagination. Think of what that purse is going to be like. Or think of what hanging out with this person is going to be like. Or think about getting that new addition built onto your home. Think about driving down the road with the Mercedes 500 E-Class with leather upholstery. Think about this. Think about this. And, of course, what he means is imagine this. Now, your imagination engages your emotions. And the longer you let your imagination engage your emotions. So you're starting now to daydream about it or to picture think it, right? That's what imagination is. It's having a picture of it. The more your emotions get engaged, emotions are what translate thoughts into actions. So then you're kind of moving in the direction of making that temptation into a reality, an action to get to that reality. And what St. Ignatius says is almost immediately, you may be finding yourself enticed. But once you stop that imagination from happening, once you use some mental discipline and you just go, I don't like where this is going. I got to stop this. And it's pulling you still. It's pulling you. It wants you back into it or the devil's pulling you back into it. And you just go, but I know this is not pleasing to God. I'm going to stop this. So you make some action to stop it. And now sometimes you just can't stop it mentally, but you can move away from it or you can just say, I'm not going to think about this right now. I'm going to think about this other thing. So you can basically replace one thing with another imagination. And you can just say, well, I still got to think about what I'm going to do for my child today or think about making my goals for my spiritual life. But you start thinking about something else. Bingo. It dispels that aberrant imagination and the devil's hold over it as well as the emotions arising out of it. Then, says Ignatius, you'll almost always notice that once you stop it, you'll feel this residual emptiness from that entertaining of that imagination. So whether it be something that has to do with anger or greed or lust or pride or vanity or any of the deadly sins, whatever it may be, The minute you stop it and disengage it, you'll feel almost its residual emptiness, loneliness, and alienation. And what's even stranger is, let's suppose you do entertain it. 
let's suppose you keep running with it and then you take an action toward it. So now you are moving toward a state of sin. Let's suppose you do that. Then St. Ignatius says, God has this way of at two in the morning, he comes to you and with you get a good sense of emptiness and loneliness and alienation. You go, what, what? Wait a minute. What's this all about? It's almost like God's not here and the world turned dark again and I don't feel any light. And all of a sudden there's a sense of emptiness. Know this. It's something going on that either happened during the day or something else. And the Lord's trying to give you a signal. So he's saying, Spitzer, he's saying, look, you got to disengage from this. You're moving in a bad direction. And so what you're feeling, right, this emptiness or loneliness or alienation, it's kind of on a cosmic level. It's not like I want to be around a friend or something like that. It's much more profound and fundamental, absolute. And it's like the absence of God. I'm lonely for God. I'm empty for God. I want to be filled by God. And I'm alienated because I'm not at home because I'm not near God. And so God gives us clues. And if we're sensitive to that, we recognize, oh, I got to get out of this. So whatever it is, it could just be a fantasy. And you could just say, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to stop that fantasy. I don't want that anymore. Lord, I'm going to take some steps to overcome. If we did go and take an action toward it, if it was something seriously sinful, we have to get to confession and try to confess that and get right with God again. You'll see that the emptiness, the loneliness, and the alienation on the cosmic level, it's just going to disappear. It's hard to go to confession, but after you get out of there, you feel like a million bucks is what really, truly, you're back right with God again. You can still feel residual guilt, but still you're back on track. And again, that sense of the absence of God wanting to be filled, the sense of emptiness, the acute loneliness, it begins to really subside. And so we get clues. There's no question about it. But the best thing is, as you already said, Lindy, when we start getting a sense, wait a minute, this is not pleasing to God. I've got to stop this. Because I am going to get the bad result in the future. I am going to get the depression that arises out of that emptiness, loneliness, and alienation. I can't live a life displeasing to God and think that as I separate myself, for thou hast made us for thyself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. If I separate myself from God, it's going to be one tough nut to crack. I got to then go to confession right away, get back to the sacraments, and just stop it. Whatever track I was going down, I have to stop it. And the reason for the sacrament of reconciliation is you're not just given absolution, definitive absolution. You're given this very powerful charism and grace and absolution for healing and for protection from the evil spirit. Because what happens when you take a path, the longer you're on the path, the longer the devil gets his grip on you. And once he's got his grip on you and your grip on your heart, and he's trying to addict you to the behavior that you're in, it gets harder and harder to do it. But think of confession as when you get that grace of absolution, at the same time, it's like also a special powerful grace and charism that God just prying the devil's fingers away from your heart. It literally is a loosening of the grip of the devil. And it's a very powerful sacrament. Yes. And I love how you use the words protection and restless because Mm -hmm. I feel like when we rest more in the Lord through all forms of prayer, Mm -hmm. worship, community, whatnot, we are more greatly protected and we're able to stay more intimately per se in the palm of God's hand. Mm -hmm. So in regards to level four and in closing, how would you encourage listeners to really stay and remain and rest in the Lord? You got to make goals on four levels. You can get all of these goals in a book called Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life. I wrote it a long time ago. It's it's really short. It's really simple, but it gives you, what are you shooting for? What 
goals do you want? You want to make some goals with respect to the sacraments. Now, probably if anybody's listening to this broadcast, they're already going to weekly mass. They're probably going to confession more than four times a year, and they're in good shape sacramentally. But maybe you could think of, well, maybe I'd like to go to weekly mass once or twice during the week, or maybe I'd like to go to confession more than three or four times a year. I'd maybe go other times. That might be some goals you might want to set. But anyway, call them sacramental goals, and that's chapter one of the book. Chapter two of the book is about spontaneous prayers. Just take those 14 spontaneous prayers in that book, like help. Lord, make good come out of whatever harm I might have caused. Lord, make some good come out of this cross that I'm suffering. Some optimal resurrection for me, for others, for the church, for the world, from this cross I'm suffering. Push back the foreboding. Push back the fear and the depression. I give up. You take care of it in that wonderful prayer, thy loving will be done. Commit these prayers, these spontaneous prayers to memory because they're little conduits of grace. And so it's really important to get them in your head so you can remember them. They're short one-liners, but they're all conduits of different kinds of grace for all occasions. So memorize those. And you can also, besides getting that book, Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life, you can get a lot of this free of charge if you go to my website, majacenter.com. And then there's four landing pages, one on faith, reason, and science, one on the evidence for the reality of Jesus, one that's on happiness and suffering, what we're talking about today, and the fourth one's called Spiritual and Moral Growth. Click on that. There's all kinds of free articles and videos on that, free of charge, so you can get all these things. The third goal is on discernment of spirits and following the Spirit, and the fourth goal is getting started on the contemplative life. They're all in that book, Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life, or Modgescenter.com. Click on Spiritual and Moral Growth, and you'll see them. Father Spitzer, thank you so much. You have blessed me so much during this time together, and I know that you will be blessing all of those who watch and listen, so thank you. Oh, thank you, Lindy. It's just been an honor being with you in your good ministry. Thank you, Father Spitzer, and you and all your good works are in my heart and in my prayers. Thank you very much. So thank you, everyone, for being with us today. And like Father Spitzer said, you can go to modgescenter.com. You can also go to mamasinspirit.com for more resources. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.